is Joseph Grant. Uh, I am an attorney with the Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County, uh, specifically in the Fair Housing Project, um, uh, where we handle uh, discrimination based on housing uh, of a protected class. So um, we're going to go over some of that uh, in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and uh, so I want to give you a little background. Uh, Legal Aid Society um, of Palm Beach County has, uh, has been here for about since 1949. Uh, its purpose was to give uh, free legal advice to economically disadvantaged, uh, the economically disadvantaged, and it serves the interest of uh, Palm Beach County residents. Uh, some uh, projects that we have at Legal Aid, um, there is no income threshold. So uh, much like the fair housing uh, project where uh, we, re we usually just investigate whether or not discrimination is, how it is occurring and, and it doesn't really matter or there's not an income threshold. Same with, uh, with um, domestic violence as well. Uh, you know, we've got over 50 attorneys here, 120 staff members. Uh, director is Bob Berta. She's been here for uh, late, like 20 something years, 28 years. Uh, and my direct supervisor, uh, her name is Tahisha Miles. So what we're going to go over today is the Fair Housing Act um, and specifically reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications, which are uh, requested um, on behalf uh, of one of the protected classes. And that protected class is disability. Uh, originally, there were um, four protected classes, race, color, um, uh, national origin, and religion. And later on, disability uh, and familial status uh, and sex was, was uh, added as well. There's also some additional protected classes uh, in different municipalities, uh, sexual orientation, um, where the, your income comes from, political affiliation, uh, and some other ones. But today, we're going to focus on disability, which um, in the Fair Housing Act lately, at least since I've worked in it, has been uh, the predominant protected class that gets the most attention, I'd say about anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of um, uh, cases evoking the Fair Housing Act have to do with disability. Uh, to move on, um, I guess we probably want to go over um, what a disability is, um, as defined by the Fair Housing Act. It's a person who has a physical or mental impairment uh, that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, it also, they have a record of such impairment or are regarding as have a, having a record of such impairment. Um, so uh, some of the easier ones to identify is maybe someone um, who's blind, uh, who can't see, obviously has a uh, physical impairment. Um, someone that's in a wheelchair uh, has a, a physical impairment. Uh, mental impairments are a little more difficult sometimes to identify, um, and that can sometimes create uh, a um, certain. Uh, if well, I'm sorry. If the impairment is obvious, the uh, when you apply for the reasonable accommodation or modification, there really shouldn't be any uh, question as to you know what you have to provide, um, and that is so that you know, it would just be another barrier. If someone who was blind was asking uh, for a certain accommodation uh, based uh, that had a need for that, then um, to, to, for them to give um, medical approval or medical um, uh, a record of that would be um, kind of, it just isn't needed in that situation. So uh, there are certain types of disability. There's visual or auditory disabilities. Um, that's blindness, hearing loss, et cetera. Uh, there's mobility disabilities, stroke, arthritis, spinal stenosis. Um, there's mental disabilities, uh, schizophrenia, depression, autism. Uh, H HIV and AIDS, um, uh, a positive status can be, is considered a, a disability. Alcoholism and past substance abuse uh, are also considered disabilities if the person is not currently addicted. Um, uh, it is not considered a disability if the person is in their active addiction. And uh, disabilities may be temporary and permanent in nature. Um, so uh, the, what is required under federal and state laws? So uh, you can't, or a housing provider cannot discriminate against a person with disabilities in terms of uh, conditions or privileges uh, of a rental or dwelling. Um, so I've said the words reasonable accommodation and reasonable modification a couple of times. Um, usually the way that they come up is that someone who, um, for instance, 
has a disability and receives monetary compensation based on that in a certain time of the month. So let's say it's the 15th and rents usually do on the first. Um, uh, what I would come in and do and say, if it would serve the disability needs since they get the money on the 15th and they would like to pay their uh, rent on, on or about that time so as to not have to save that money uh, for a few weeks coming up, I could ask for an accommodation to the rental provider or the housing provider um, and say, you know, we would like you to accommodate uh, them by changing your policy um, or procedure. And that's what a, an accommodation is, a change to a policy or procedure of a housing provider uh, that meets the needs of the person's disability. So not only does it, you know, the, the accommodation have to do with policies and procedures, but it also has to meet uh, a, a disability need of the person applying for it. Um, reasonable modifications are physical changes. So uh, for instance, um, putting a ramp up for someone who is on um, uh, in a wheelchair would be considered a modification. Installing a, uh, a bar so that uh, in a shower so that a person can lower themselves or hold themselves up would be a, um, a modification. So you're, mo you're physically modifying um, types that were something that has to do with the housing. So, um, you know, possible modifications would be remove cabinets under a sink. If a person is uh, in a wheelchair and needs to be closer to the sink so as to wash their hands, they have to be up to where usually a lot of housing providers would have cabinetry. So if you're asking to remove those, somebody can, uh, can gain access. Installing mailboxes that can be accessible for people in wheelchairs, so lowering them. Um, the, uh, and like I said, installing ramps, uh, modifying switches. When you go on light, light switches are usually uh, a little bit higher and they move them down. Um, uh, modify uh, door handles or doorknobs to levers, things of that nature would be reasonable modifications. So requesting an accommodation. Uh, there's not any magic words. You don't have to um, always have an, you know, while it usually helps to have an advocate, like an attorney, do it. Um, there, it just doesn't need be. You know, the, the Fair Housing Act is made to, uh, its intent was to um, provide uh, people um, that to not be discriminated, discriminated against uh, based on their protected class. So uh, requesting the accommodation, there's no magic words that evoke uh, you know, like a lot of lawyers would be comes now or wherefore. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything like that. Um, but what it should have, it should state that uh, the person has a disability that limits uh, major life activity. It should clearly state with the accommodation uh, what is actually being requested. Um, hopefully that's not too tenuous. Um, you know, I need this or this person needs this and explain how the accommodation will lessen the limitation caused by the disability. And they call that a nexus, so that there's a connection between what's being um, uh, requested and uh, what the disability is. Um, uh, a letter from a, a medical service provider, such as a doctor or a therapist is usually helpful. Um, ideally, uh, should be more than one sentence on a prescription pad, um, you know, that, that sometimes person needs blah. Uh, unless it's readily apparent that the person's disability is served that way by a reasonable, prudent person standard, as a lot of times we use in law, um, then you may, the person requesting the accommodation or modification may want to get a little bit more of a fulsome disclosure from the provider uh, telling them what, how the, the item being requested serves that purpose. Um, the, individual, it, the individual does not need to disclose the dispis, dis, uh, the disability or treating history. So this isn't, um, the Fair Housing Act does not require someone to waive all their HIPAA rights um, and you know, let the housing provider know exactly what kind of disability they have. Um, so uh, only that there is one and that this, there is a nexus between what's being uh, requested and that. Um, and undue delay in responding to these kinds of modifications or accommodations um, may be considered a denial. Uh, so, you know, a lot of um, ones that come up are service animals. You know, uh, there are service animals and emotional support animals. Um, service animals, emotional support animals are not pets. They provide a service to benefit uh, 
a disabled individual. Uh, service animals, and they call them emotional support animals or ESAs, are not required to have specialized training. Um, this is a, a confusing to a lot of people. They say, you know, this servant is obviously not trained. Um, what it does need to do is, it doesn't need to be trained, the animal, but it does need to service one of the disability, the disabled person's disabilities. Um, so an example of a service animal would be seeing eye dog. A lot of people know that. Or um, uh, hearing dogs and then uh, seizure assistant alert dogs so that if someone is going into a grand mal seizure, they can notify other people. Um, more commonly, or at least that's been seen lately, are ESAs, the emotional support animals. They provide therapeutic benefit through their very existence. So companionship, affection, um, focus outside oneself, encouraged to be uh, physically active or going for walks. Um, but again, those uh, animals are also included in the Fair Housing Act when talking about reasonable accommodations um, to allow those animals to be in places that would uh, apartment complexes and HOAs that would usually prohibit them. And it's not just dogs. Any animal can potentially be a emotional support animal, a cat, fish, bird, et cetera. Um, just that it, the person is disabled and the animal, um, the animal fits one of those disabilities. Uh, Okay. So the reasonable modification. So um, the so reasonable modifications kind of there is uh, certain there's differences between uh, a lot of places that have either um, areas of where the public enters and housing. So this is a lot of people depart on uh, when asking for um, reasonable modifications, they get it a little bit confused with uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Uh, so that while both can be evoked in certain situations, um, when you're talking about a, a housing provider by itself, that is usually gonna be governed by the Fair Housing Act. Unless um, there is some, uh, let's say you're in a, in a, in a housing provider, like um, a, an apartment complex that has a leasing office and uh, the person's disabled and needs access in a wheelchair and needs access to the, um, the leasing office. Maybe there's a pool uh, that is used by the rest of the association or a common area room because that's not directly related to the housing, that's more in a common area, that would be related uh, more to uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. But if the place also has, the apartment complex has a, um, an elevator and that elevator takes somebody up to the second floor, but there's stairs to go up to the, the place to get to the elevator and that's where their home is, then that would be more related to the Fair Housing Act. So we would do a reasonable modification uh, request under that. Um, uh, we, what does have to happen sometimes is in a reasonable modification, we're talking about structural changes. Sometimes those costs are borne on by the person who's requesting them. So uh, the installation, let's say, of um, that in, in, a, in a bathroom, um, the, to, to get out and in, into the tub, um, that installation, it, it may be borne on by the person who's requesting it, not only to put it in, but then to take it out if, uh, if it was a lease and then they leave the apartment. So uh, usually the Fair Housing Act and, and, uh, is facilitated by a, uh, an agency called HUD and that's Housing and Urban Development. And they give kind of guidelines how, how these types of procedures are going to, to work. And uh, they have dictated or at least suggested that it be an interactive process. So uh, I'm kind of gonna go through start to finish you know, how a normal one or a likely outcome of one would be, is it would be uh, someone contacts a housing provider, let's say it's a, an apartment complex. So they usually have property managers. Uh, the person would um, contact the property manager and say, uh, so-and-so is disabled. Um, we are requesting, you know, a closer parking spot um, because of that disability. Uh, the, the, the further parking spot is, in, is it inhibiting their use and enjoyment of the home, um, and they can't really access the property as well as they should. 
So a person would say, you know, we are requesting uh, that this person be granted a reasonable accommodation uh, and be given a closer parking spot. Attached, please find a note from uh, a independent medical provider um, attesting to the, the validity of the request. And in the note, it would say something like, uh, I have been treating uh, blah, uh, this person for this long. Um, this person is disabled um, as stated in, and has one or more physical limitations or mental limitations that uh, inhibit uh, one or more like life activities. And the assigning of a parking space would uh, improve their use and enjoyment of the property. It doesn't really have to have that last one. That one is kind of more on the attorney side, but it would, it would improve um, uh, the use of their property. And so that would be requested. And then the person would say, oh, you know, let's say there was a little bit of feedback, like these things are been assigned, you know, for other people. And, you know, it would be a lot of hassle. Um, we don't know if, you know, we're going to have to change all these things. That is, um, but we're not denying it. We would like to enter into a discussion. At that point, um, if they don't flat out say no, and they say, let's discuss it, come to a table, because HUD really likes these, uh, or, or likes to see there be an interactive process. Um, you know, like most law, it's, it's the, um, the right of the individual versus the right of the society, the societal right. Um, however, uh, in this situation, uh, the federal government, uh, through the legislature, passed the Fair Housing Act. And um, there are special considerations for people um, under those protected classes um, that I talked about. Uh, after granted or denied, um, if it's denied, and, and it is sometimes the, the, the request, there is in Palm Beach County, the, uh, there's an organization called the Office of Equal Opportunity. Um, where a complaint could be submitted um, based on the denial of a reasonable accommodation or modification. And uh, they would evaluate, um, you know, the narrative that the person uh, stating that their, their rights have been violated in the Fair Housing Act. And they would issue after their investigation uh, a determination clause or letter and say, you know, has this or has this not occurred? And they would ask the, the, the parties to enter into um, what's called conciliation, very similar to mediation. You know, let's talk this out. Where, how can we resolve what's going on? And usually when independent people are, uh, are brought to the table that um, uh, those kinds of situations can be remedied. So uh, I hope this has helped everyone out a little bit on how to or understand the Fair Housing Act was specifically with reasonable accommodations and modifications. Um, I thank you all for being here. Uh,